channels can be set to many different modes, some of which synchronize to the module's global tempo. I'm going to uh, really briefly show you each of these modes. I suppose we will start by initializing the patch. Now we're going to listen to the Piston Honda Mark III wavetable oscillator to hear the effect of our modulations. listening to a single oscillator from the Piston Honda. That's what it sounds like when we modulate the waveform position. And now we are going to use an LFO from the Kermit to do the same. You can hear that's a simple sine wave LFO modulating the piston. On channels A and B, we have dedicated controls for each of the main parameters. Frequency, Frequency, amplitude, and the waveform, which is shown on the display as you change it. Kermit holds 64 waveforms internally, which are separated into eight different banks. You access the banks by using the alternate parameter selection, where you hold down the channel select button and turn the waveform knob. Now we'll pick from the different waveform banks. There are several different classes of uh, modulation that you can achieve with Kermit. We've been listening to the LFO. There's also Audio Rate Oscillator, which we'll listen to in a few minutes. And there's Envelope, which we'll try right now. So instead of having a continuously running waveform, Envelope mode waits for a trigger event to happen. So let's give it some triggers from the sequencer. You can hear the envelope shape being triggered once each time the quarter note happens on the sequencer. Let's go back to our basic wave bank. If you get into the menus, you can use Kermit to uh, bias the voltage upward so that you only get unipolar voltages out in the envelope mode. And you also have a one volt mode for use with video synths. But in banks 6 and 7 of the internal Kermit waveform memory, you can, uh, all the waveforms there are designed for unipolar use. They start at the extreme negative end and they go up positive at half the rate. So you can kind of see them on the display there. 
Now let's listen to them affecting the oscillator. The next envelope mode is the uh, gated repeat mode. So it will trigger on a rising edge that comes into the channel's 1 volt per octave input. But if it's held longer, as in a gate event, it will continue to cycle the oscillator until the falling edge. So let's make those gates a little longer on the sequencer. Now you can hear the envelope repeating. Next modulation class is random. First we have stepped random as in a sample and hold that's fed by a noise source. Next is smooth random, like the fluctuating random voltages. Remember, you can always use the amplitude controls to attenuate the Kermit's output voltages. Next, we have a sample and hold function, where we again use the modules. Uh, channels one volt per octave input to sample the control voltage elsewhere in the system. So I'm going to uh, make a voltage come out of the sequencer here. effect is subtle, but you can hear it sampling the sequencer voltage being triggered by the sequencer's gate output, and you can also use the onboard amplitude control to attenuate that. The next mode is track and hold. input is low, it will hold the voltage steady, but if it is high, it will pass the input to the output through the attenuator. Now, each one of these modes has a, a tempo aware mode. Kermit has a global tempo. You can see always see its BPM there in the lower right corner of the screen. There's a tap tempo button in the corner.
So we've tapped in 127 BPM there with the onboard button. Let's go back to our basic LFO mode now. We've set it to tempo LFO. So instead of the frequency knob determining the actual rate, it's the uh, it's the tap tempo clock of the whole module that is determining it. So I'm going to take us back to a basic sine wave on bank one. The tempo division is one. The tempo is 122.8 BPM expressed in quarter notes. In this mode, the big frequency knob changes the divisor or the multiplication of the tempo. So let's go down to divide by two. Divide by three. Divide by four. Let's bring in a kick drum from the sequencer so we can hear this with a tempo reference. Now we're going to patch the, uh, the clock signal back into the Kermit, and now it will sync up. So let's go to multiplication one. When I plug this cable in, it will sync up. There we go. Now it's at divide by four. At lower divisions, you can get stuff sounding really interesting if you modulate the waveform while it's playing. The first three banks of Kermit's waveform memory are specially set up for tempo usage. You can see these uh, waveforms on the display. You can hear the transitions in the waveform set to uh, happen on divisions of the waveform span, so when you divide the frequency down, the transitions in the waveform happen at rhythmically interesting points. That's easy to do visually if you want to write your own custom waveforms in the WaveEdit program. They have the dividers set up there on the screen. So this sounds kind of interesting, but how about some more motion? We can see the channel B isn't really doing anything right now. It's just set to the basic LFO at 2.1 hertz. What if we could make that modulate the waveform? So instead of holding down the channel A button and turning its own knobs to access the alternate parameters, if you hold down the channel B button and turn a knob on channel A, that will cause channel B's output to modulate the control that you're touching on channel A. So let's send B over to the waveform and watch the virtual attenuator pop up on the screen.
so the frequency remains synced to uh, one fourth of 80.9 BPM, which is what the sequencer is running. But the waveform is morphing. You can watch a change on the display like that. And each different waveform has different action in each of the divisions within the waveform. So it doesn't take too long of messing around with Kermit's internal modulation bus to come up with interesting settings that interact between channels. We'll take a break from listening to the Piston Honda now and listen to the internal oscillator of Kermit. If you're familiar with the Mark I version of Kermit, it had a when you ran it up at audio rates, it would have a very dirty, fuzzy, unstable quality. Some of those qualities remain in this Mark III version. Turning on the oscillator now. Yeah, we can hear the waveform modulation that we plugged in on uh, when we were just listening to it in LFO mode. If you want to view the active modulations at any time, make sure you're on the main screen and just hold down the encoder button. You'll see a grid. The columns represent each channel, and the rows represent each of the main parameters, frequency, amplitude, and waveform, and they'll show whether they're being modulated by control voltage or any of the internal channels. You can hear some nice aliasing at the high end there. To make that modulation a little more intense on, from channel B. Change the wave bank. There are some waves in here that I designed for audio use, whether they're collections of harmonics that evolve, or real crunchy things like from old versions of the Piston Honda or Kermit. Here's one. Channel B is modulating the waveform of the Kermit internal oscillator at 0.075 Hz. The next oscillator mode is Unison. It runs a copy of the same oscillator, slightly detuned. Certain wave banks have a PPG kind of quality to them. So I see the sequencer is still running. Let's tempo sync that modulating LFO. Bring back our reference. now. The Kermit internal oscillator has a few character settings that you may know from the Piston Honda. They cause different degradations to happen to the signal, whether it's the uh, 
the horizontal frequency of the wavetable, you can have virtually 32 samples instead of 256. The vertical resolution of the waveform from naturally it's 16 bits, but you can take it down to 12 and then 8. And then the uh, resolution of the morph as well. That's what it sounds like with the morph turned off. So you're just switching between waveforms instead. There's the 12-bit setting, so you can start to hear some of the quantization noise. But it's still morphing. There's 8-bit, so you get even more. And then there's the depraved setting, which gives you the 32 sample horizontal resolution, no morph. It was meant to be a lot like the uh, Konami SEC chip that was used for certain games on the MSX platform, where your waveform morph is determined by how well you program those really short wavetables. So I'm going to switch the wave bank to something a bit more harmonic so you can hear the effect of that. <laughs> Switch back to 12 bit now. So that's what the degraded resolution sounds like with full morph. There's one more audio rate mode called Code Scan. One of my favorite things was on the early firmwares of the Buchla 259E oscillator. You could make it skip out of the, the wavetable space of the internal memory and start reading from other parts of the program memory instead. So I've simulated my favorite parts of that mode. I'm just gonna Clear the modulations on channel A to start by going into the menu. That sounds like what you'd expect. Now when you turn the waveform control, instead of modulating a wavetable, you're selecting the memory location that it's trying to oscillate within. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to patch this up in stereo with channel B in code scan as well. stereo. Now I'm going to use the channels C and D of Kermit to modulate the waveforms of each of the channels separately so we will get a nice spacious noisy effect.
And you know what? We can tempo sync those two LFOs as well by going into the menu and setting the appropriate mode. tempo reference back in. Those are just simple sine waves modulating the memory location of either of the stereo channels. going to move back to modulating something else with the Kermit. I'll take a second to repatch here. Yes, you can ask a question. Um, with code scan, I may have missed you saying this. Uh, people were asking about it over the internet. Um, but it's, and I know you have a description some of it, but like the Buchla module, it, you turn the waveform knob to find the sort of sonic spaces you're looking for in the memory. Yeah. It still says waveform on, on the knob, but when you're in code scan, when you turn that knob, it selects the memory location where it's trying to oscillate within a short space. And it, the display kind of shows a memory offset, which doesn't really mean anything. It's just there for effect. So you turn it like the blue gloss there, so you hear something like stick there and modulate. it. So it's somewhat yeah, somewhat. You, you really don't know what kind of sound you're going to get out of it, but the frequency itself is predictable. That's a cool feature. So let's go over some of the other features of Kermit. You have the 64 waveforms on board, which are organized into eight banks of eight waveforms each. There's also an SD card slot on the front panel where you can uh, upload your own custom waveforms. And it's pretty simple. You use uh, Synthesis Technologies Wave Edit program to design 64 of these waves. It's very visual. You can do it in the amplitude domain or harmonically. And you save a wave file from this. You give it a specific file name, put it on your SD card, put it in the module, get into your global menu, and hit load waves from SD and it'll write the new wave memory, restart, now you have your own custom waves. No special programming adapter or software necessary. Speaking a little more about the modulation matrix, on channels A and B we have full controls three knobs, a volt per octave or a trigger input, and then a CV input. That CV input doesn't have an attenuator attached to it because you use the virtual attenuators of the mod matrix just like you would with uh, the internal bus assignments. So if you hold down the black rotary encoder button and rotate your desired parameter that you'd like to have modulated, it'll tell you that you're assigning CV to it and you can adjust them out like that. That means that anything arriving at that CV input will go out to whatever parameters you've selected. So we just put in a little CV waveform. Let's put in some CV amplitude as well.
We're still code scanning there. Now, uh, let's just cross pass, cross patch the uh, channel C output into that CV input to show you how it works when we go outside the panel. so it's easier to hear. And it helps if you're actually listening to the Kermit again. Now we're using the external voltage to modulate the waveform and the amplitude. So it takes some time to set up your desired way of operating with the Kermit. But like all Mark III modules, it has a voltage controlled preset manager on it. It can store eight different presets. I'm getting repatched here for the next part of the demonstration. I have a question. Yes. From the web. That's a question from, from the web. Uh, Most likely, the Volkmeyer's Inferno granular synthesizer will be the next module developed. We're doing pretty well on that so far. All right, so we're listening to a couple different sounds right now. And Kermit's modulating them. So. Going into the preset manager to look around, we can randomize everything on the panel. Right now, Kermit's patched to a Hertz donut and a piston Honda running through a bionic Lester with its four outputs controlling things like filter cutoff and waveform morph. So just randomizing around until we hear something good. But if we enter the preset manager, we have eight different settings saved. Like here's one with three different tap tempo channels. There's one with two tap tempo channels and one uh, tempo aware stepped random and then a smooth random modulating some other stuff in there. If you look at the mod matrix for this one, it's kind of complicated. Another one that's similar with slightly different modulation division settings.
Here's one of my favorites, which is four tap tempo step randoms. There's one in the tempo envelope mode, which I haven't gone over yet. In tempo envelope, you don't manually trigger the envelope. It gets triggered once at the start of every division that you program in. So it has the same divisions as the other tap tempo modes, but it will oscillate the waveform once when you uh, trigger it that way. And you can use the fine tune control on the oscillator to adjust the time of the envelope in that mode. And then the normal big knob control just adjusts your division or your uh, multiplication. Here's another one here with uh, an audio rate oscillator, two tap tempos, and the smooth random. It's so going back to preset one here. Turning on the presets on all the modules now, so we can make a nice sound that I came up with while setting up this patch today. Preset Manager is voltage controllable and it also has a morph mode which you can use to achieve experimental results. The modes themselves don't switch in morph mode, but you can access all your knob programming from adjacent presets so you can achieve different sounds that you won't really think of directly. So one last thing, I'm going to unplug this sound and then uh, we're going to do one more thing with Kermit's internal oscillator, where we're going to build a patch completely 
from scratch with no patch chords going on other than the tempo. So we're going to initialize. our oscillator. Let's make it so the tempo envelope is controlling the amplitude of that oscillator. Turn that all the way off. Channel C will be our envelope. We're going to set it to the 0 to 6 volt unipolar mode. So it starts at 0 volts, opens up the virtual VCA all the way, comes back down to 0. Set up the wave bank so we have an ADSR like thing. Now we hold down channel C and assign that to amplitude. So there, we've only used two channels and we already have a simple note event going on. Let's set channel D to smooth random. And we'll have that morph the waveform. Oscillator B, an audio rate oscillator, make it a sign so it can be nice and simple, and have that amplitude modulate our main oscillator in channel A. One last thing. Channel C and D have very limited controls, so doing their mod matrix and CV assignments, you'll have to memorize a set of button hold combinations. But they have the full parameters, other than one volt per octave inputs that the other channels have. So because they are lacking an input, they can't do the sample and hold or track and hold. But instead, they have the channel copy mode. So you can have it select a, a source that you want to copy from. So I, now I have channel C copying channel A. Let's listen to those both on the mixer. Clear all our modulations.
now you're in the copy mode, the, all the parameters of the copying channel follow that of the source. But the reason this is, is so you can have phase differences. So they will always follow the same frequency, but you can phase offset one from the other by using the phase command. It's like changing the command that you use to change the waveform bank, but you do it with the amplitude knob instead of the waveform knob. So as you can see, you can see the phase offset given in degrees. So you can make envelopes out of any waveform that have a peak elsewhere than the beginning by scooting them over. And you can also uh, set the source channel to envelope and have the copying channel copy that and start at a different point in the waveform. Just use your imagination to find things like that. Does anyone have any questions about Kermit Mark III? Yeah, I mentioned that. It's fairly simple. You uh, simply get a 16-bit a mono wave file that has 64 times 256 samples on it. Wave Edit, a program by Synthesis Technology, will let you uh, create such a file visually. It's free. And you put that wave file on an SD card, put it in the slot, go to your global menu, select load waves from SD. Then it will write the waveforms, check to see if the file is valid, and then reboot. We have another question. Is that uh, save so if you reboot the module, does it load that? Yeah, when you load from the SD card, it writes it to the internal memory, so it persists after power down. Uh, right now, it just uh, you, you give it the name one dot wave, so you have to do your file management elsewhere. And I'm I'm writing a new file management library as I work on this granular synthesizer. So soon it will know how to look for files. Uh, you could probably there's probably enough memory on there that you can. Uh, fit a very brief sample. Let me, forgetting my upper powers of two here, so let me tell you how many samples you can get out of it. 16,000 samples, so you get a nice closed hi-hat, or the little blips from the Casio SK-1 internal ROM. I have a, I have a question from the web. We have another question from the web. Dan from the internet noticed some differences in the, uh, the range buttons on the Stilson hammer. I'm looking at the screen of our video camera right now. It does look really cool. Like, look at that. They're, they're fading from red to orange to green. That's awesome. That just made me a video but I, I'm, I'm looking at it with my eyes beneath the camera. I, I just see the flicker of the orange. Yeah, Though the way the LEDs are achieved on the Stilson hammer, it, there's a lot of weird PWM stuff. I, I can't wait to hear what kind of interference my radio picks up from it. Uh, what you're seeing is just a difference in the, uh, the frame rate of the video camera and the refresh rate of the LEDs on the Stilson hammer. And it does look really nice. Earlier versions of the Hertz Donut Mark II had uh, 
it had this nice red to orange to green fade for the waveforms in LFO mode, but it was a bit noisy, so I discontinued it. And, uh, where will you be appearing next, by the way? Where will I be appearing yeah, you, There's next? a synth uh, conference here in uh, Portland next week. I don't know if everybody knows about that. Maybe yeah, sure. there's a synth meet in Portland going on next week. I'll be presenting some stuff there. I am booked to uh, see to have a table at Superbooth in April, but conditions for international travel may be uh, restrictive at that point, so I can't say what will happen for sure. Otherwise, I'll be at uh, KnobCon in September. But in the next two months, I should have a bunch of really neat things finished, and I'll show them off one way or another. The current draw of the Kermit Mark III is somewhere in the neighborhood of 125 to 135 milliamps. How'd you know that was what I was going to ask? I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you have fans out there. I'll, I'll measure it when I get home, I promise. I have a piece of test equipment that's he appropriate says, for measuring it. Five views. <laughs> Pricing is 400 US dollars for four count them four channels.